Jeffrey Monastine. If you've been part of our worship in the word, our worship community, you will recognize him from, from sharing in that. And he's going to lead us all week, uh, just li a living example of what, what a worship leader is and that paradigm and, and, and how he conducts himself are things that you can take and apply in the ministry and the marketplace. And then after that, we'll hear from Pastor Nathaniel Drew. Actually, all of our friends and family will hear from Pastor Nathaniel Drew. So Jeffrey, thanks for joining us tonight, sir. Thanks for having me. Our God is a great God, isn't he? Psalm 34 verse one says, I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. So we're gonna give God some praise this evening. Um, even though I can't see you, I just want you to lift up your hands. I want you to sing along with me um, because we're gonna give our God a great praise because he's worthy of it, amen? Amen. The song says, how great is our God? And I want you to sing along with me. Come on and lift it up. Hey, yo. Say yo. Say yo. Come on, let's sing that one more time. Say yo. Say yo. Say yo. Come on, you know it. Sing with me. How great. Is our God sing with me? How great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. Come on and clap your hands. We serve a mighty God who's worthy of all our praise, amen. Come on, let's sing that one more time. Say, How great. Is our God. God sing with me? How great, me how great. and all will see how, how great, how great, how great is our God. Come on and clap your hands, everybody. If you believe He's a mighty God, if you believe He's a way maker, come on and lift up your voice and give Him the praise that is due His name. This part says. I lift, I lift my hands to give you glory. Yeah. I lift my hands to give you praise. And I'll praise you, Lord. I'll praise you, Lord. Come on. Will you praise him? Yeah. Say, I lift my hands to give you glory. I lift my hands to give you praise, and I'll praise you, Lord. I'll praise you, Lord. Come on, will you praise him? Yes. I lift my head because you've been so good, God. And I lift my hands to give you praise. I'll praise you, Lord. I'll praise you, Lord. Come on. Will you praise him? Yeah. Come on and lift it up and say, I lift my head to give you glory. And I lift my hands to give you praise. Come on. I'll praise you, Lord. I'll praise you, Lord. Will you praise me? Yeah. Praise him. Yeah. Hey, I lift my hands. Come on, put your hands on it. To give you glory. Hallelujah. I lift my hands. To give you praise. Hey, I'll praise you, Lord. I'll praise you, Lord. Hey, I'll praise you, Lord. I'll praise you, Lord. In the midst of my struggle, in the midst of the storm, say, I'll praise you, Lord, and I'll praise you, Lord. I will bless the Lord, and his praise will continue to be in my mouth. I'll praise you, Lord, and I'll praise you, Lord. 
In the midst of my struggle, in the midst of the pain, no matter what's going on around me, I'll praise you, Lord. I'll praise you, Lord. God, you've been so faithful. God, you've been so great. God, you are merciful in all your ways. God, you are the cornerstone. We give you glory. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise, yeah. Because you are the cornerstone, God. So if you know this song, come on and sing along with me. We're gonna give our God the praise that is due Him. He is a cornerstone. He holds us together. No matter what's going on around us in the world, our God is faithful, He's ever true, He's ever present, and His hands are holding you right now. Come on and sing along with me, say. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I may not trust in his refrain, but holy trust, but holy trust in Jesus' name. Come on and sing that with me one more time. Every voice lifted up. My hope is built. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust. I dare not trust the sweetest frame. But holy trust in Jesus. Holy trust in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Let's lift it up and say, Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong, and the Savior's love, and through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. Hallelujah. When darkness seems to hide His face, Darkness seems to hide his face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. In his righteousness alone, Father, stand before the throne. How many people want to be prostrate before the throne? God, we give you glory. God, we give you honor. God, we celebrate you. God, we give you glory. God, we give you honor. God, we celebrate you. For your faithfulness is our truth. For your faithfulness is true. Great is your faithfulness, oh God. Great is your faithfulness, oh God. We lift you glory. We give you glory. We give you glory. We give you honor. God, we lift you up. God, we lift you up. You are the cornerstone. You are the cornerstone. You are the righteous one. You are the righteous one. We that is due your name, that is due your name. Oh, 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 oh. come on.
come on, lift them up and say, Christ alone, cornerstone, we can make strong in the Savior's love and through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. Christ alone, say, Christ. Okay, you, you might not have ever told yourself that, but please allow me to just go ahead and open up the curtains before your eyes and let you know that you are a leader uh, by God has called you to leadership. So this applies to you as well. Genesis chapter seven is, is where we are. And I just want to read a few verses in your hearing, verses one through five. Very well-known story, um, I'm sure, for many of you, if not all of you, who will view this. Genesis chapter seven and I'll read in your hearing from the English Standard Version of the Bible. Forgive me if I don't have the version uh, that you're reading from. But Genesis chapter 7, verses 1 through 5, reads this way. Then the Lord said to Noah, go into the ark, you and all your household. For I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of all clean animals, the male and his mate, and a pair of the animals that are not clean or unclean, the male and his mate. And seven pairs of the birds of the heavens also, male and female, to keep their offspring alive on the face of all the earth. Verse 4, for in seven days, for in seven days, if you're with me, your Bible says, for in seven days I will send rain on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. And every living thing, do you catch that? That I have made, God said, every living thing that I have made, I will blot out from the face of the earth or from the face of the ground. And then verse five is just where I want to hang my hat and that'll serve as the springboard for where we'll go this evening. Verse five says, and Noah, did all that the Lord had commanded him. Did you catch that? Verse five, once again, and Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. Uh, for the next few moments that is ours, I just want to speak to you this evening um, under that framework, Genesis chapter seven, verses one through five. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, here we are. We thank you for this time and for this opportunity. You've called us in some kind of way to be a leader. And so I pray that you would instruct us, that you would teach us. And we thank you for your presence. Heal the world is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Um, I don't know if there are many of you out there who are watching who will agree with the sentiments that I'm about to share um, and I'm okay with that because I am sold on, on my conviction. And that conviction is that I love the spirit that is inside of little children. Uh, call me biased. Maybe it has something to do with the fact that I'm a father of a little child right now. But I just love the spirit that is inside little children. Something about the innocence in, in little children, uh, something about the adventure that you can see in their eyes, right, where everything seems to be an adventurous experience for, for them. Uh, maybe it's their, their purity, right? Uh, I, just, I just love the spirit that is inside little children. Uh, in, in, in my opinion, children are funny. And maybe some of you can agree with me, especially those of you who have children of your own, that you almost have to brace yourself 
because you never know what will come out of a child's mouth. One of the funniest experiences is when you're at church and that children's story time comes and they open up the floor for questions and comments because you never know what can come out of the mouth of a child. Children, I'm sure you can agree, are funny. But not only are children funny, but children are imaginative. It's my belief, call me crazy, I just believe that some of the most brilliant minds are inside of little children. In fact, I would say um, that if we were to carry more in our minds from a mental standpoint, if we were to carry more with us um, from what we had as little children, I think that we would be all the better and even more brilliant today if we carried some of those aspects that we had mentally as children. Children have this ability to just imagine without limitations. And it's oftentimes us as adults who feel uncomfortable with the way that children imagine things. We're often the ones that place limitations and blinders on children that in their minds do not exist. You understand what I'm saying? They, they just have this ability to imagine, to think, to be intuitive with no limitations at all. I love that about children. Children are funny, and I'm sure you can agree with that. Children are also imaginative, but not only that, children are also inquisitive. If you're anything like me, when you had a child, and even if you just know children, maybe a niece or a nephew, uh, for, for some reason, when they get to that age of about two years old, uh, they start to question everything. They want to know why this and why that, where this comes from, why does that do that? They, they often ask questions because of this curiosity that they have inside of them. They're just so inquisitive. They're learning so much about life. And so nothing seems like an outlandish question for them. And whatever comes to their mind, they will ask it because children are funny that way. And children are imaginative that way. And they're also inquisitive that way. Uh, but not only are children those three things, but also all children seem to have this ability to believe anything you tell them as fact. I hope you're with me. Uh, we're going somewhere in just a moment. All, all children seem to have this ability to believe anything you tell them as fact, regardless of how crazy it might sound or how outlandish or otherworldly it might be. Children just have this, this, this innocence about them and this propensity to trust and to believe where they will listen to anything and believe just about anything you tell them as if it were fact. And so my daughter, who is two years old, about to be three later on this month, my, my two-year-old daughter literally hangs on every word that comes from my mouth. And sometimes it gets me in trouble. And my wife has to check me because I have to watch uh, what I say to her. I'm a jokester, so I like joking. But sometimes I have to be careful just what I say to her because she hangs on every word that comes out of my mouth. Somebody who's watching this understands what I'm talking about because you have some experience with this as well. And so here's what I'm saying. It, it could be something like this, where I could literally tell my daughter that ice cream, you follow me, that ice cream is about to fall from the sky. Are you with me? I, I could tell my daughter that that ice cream is about to fall from the sky and, and she will not look at me and say, Daddy, that's crazy. Ice cream can't fall from the sky. She won't look at me and say, Daddy, what are you talking about? That's foolish. She won't look at me and say, uh, uh, Daddy, you're not going to trick me. Uh, there's no way. That's impossible. No, no. She won't say, my two-year-old daughter won't say that to me. If I tell her that ice cream is about to fall from the sky, I promise you, with no doubt in my mind, the very next steps of my daughter will be to run and find the nearest bucket that she can find and wait literally so that she can catch ice cream as it falls from the sky. And as humorous as that might sound, here is the reality, that because I said it, it does not even occur to my daughter how illogical ice cream falling from the sky really is. Even though she had never seen that, even though she had never witnessed anything like that before, just because I said it, it does not even cross her mind that how illogical and impossible it would be for ice cream to fall from the sky. 
Uh, I think we can all agree on one thing, and that is that these are uncertain times. Yeah, it seems that things are ever-changing and ever-evolving. Really, it doesn't matter what aspect of life you are looking at, whether you're leading in a spiritual capacity, whether you're leading in the corporate world, whether you're a leader in a classroom setting, or whether you're looking at the condition and chaos of our world, it seems that things are ever-changing and ever-evolving, where, where people are crying out literally for something different. I want you to hear me now, uh, that people are crying out for something different different. They are hungering for newness. They are thirsting for innovation, right? And the more people are crying out for different, uh, the more people are hungering for newness and are thirsting for innovation. If we were honest, that spells pressure for a leader. Oh yeah, we don't like to admit uh, when we feel under pressure, but the fact that there is such a demand for different, a constant demand for newness, a constant demand for innovation, that if we could be honest with ourselves as leaders, that spells pressure. Pressure to stay ahead of the curve. Pressure just to stay in the game. Pressure to remain relevant. Pressure to be needed. Pressure to be different. And here's what I need you to catch in your spirit this evening, that the danger for leaders, please don't miss this, the danger for leaders is that those things, what things? Staying ahead of the curve and staying in the game and being relevant, being needed and being different. The danger for leaders is that those things become the primary impetus of the primary driving force for our leadership instead of being the necessary byproducts of our leadership. Oh, I, hope, I hope that you did not miss that. Uh, I understand that I'm not suggesting that there's anything wrong with staying ahead of the curve. I'm not trying to cast doubt uh, on whether it's okay to stay in the game. I'm not trying to say that it's unessential for us to be relevant or be needed or be different. What I am suggesting is that, that there's a danger when for leaders, those things become the main driving force, the, the primary impetus for our leadership instead of the necessary byproducts of our leadership. In other words, as leaders, many of us are being driven by the wrong thing. You see, the reason why I can, I, and I hope that it's not coming across to you as, as arrogant, but, but the reason why I'm passionately uh, speaking in this way and saying these things is because believe it or not, uh, the Holy Spirit is cutting me up with every word that is being uttered out of my mouth. I've had to come to grips. And, and so will you, if you want to be, and I want to be the kind of leaders that God has called us to be, it will require us to at least admit the fact that many Maybe I'm being driven as a leader by the wrong things. Yeah, yeah, I have to come to grips with the fact that maybe uh, what the main impetus for my, uh, my status as a leader has been driven by status. For some of us, it's been driven by accolades. It's been driven by value. It's been driven by being patted on your back. So Both kinds of outside recognitions are coming my way. But I'm just suggesting that could it be, friends of mine, that maybe as leaders we're being driven by the wrong things. And so if you're asking the question, that's why I'm so grateful for the example of Noah's leadership. Yeah, I've read Noah's story many times, like I'm sure that many of you have. I've listened to it in children's stories. I've watched it in movie settings. I've heard it even in sermons. Uh, but the Lord has shown me something new, at least for me, concerning the leadership of Brother Noah. And so I'm grateful this evening for the example of Noah's leadership. As many of you know, Noah existed during a time of sheer crisis. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, no. If, if there's no one else in Bible times that understands the crisis that we are in right now in 2020, uh, Noah understands what it's like to exist at a time of sheer crisis uh, because he existed in crisis, even a pandemic, if you will. 
where the word of God says that at the time where Moses was living, well, not Moses, but Noah was living and then called into a leadership opportunity, that sinfulness was at an all-time high, that wickedness was everywhere you looked and turned on the earth, where the Bible makes it crystal clear that change was needed that newness was necessary, uh, that an innovative idea was required, that, that, that if, if, if nothing else took place, uh, he knew enough to know that something needed to change. And so the Bible seems to suggest that God even thought as much to the point where the word says that God was moved to declare regret, watch this y'all, for creating the very people that he sculpted with his two hands on his two knees and declared were very good. What is the word of God saying? The word of God is saying that man was so depraved at that point that the world was in such crisis that God looked at his creation. He looked at humanity and said, I wish that I had not gone through with creation. And this being the very people that God looked at and said, I can't just call you good because you're better than the fish of the sea and the birds of the air. I can't just call you good because you're better than the land animals, the vegetation and the water. No, God looked at humanity and said, you are very good. And that same humanity that he sculpted and then looked at and declared was very good, God regretted in his heart that he made them because that was the kind of crisis that Noah existed in. So here's the reality, y'all. There's a number of things that normally stand out to us about Noah's story. Some of you might call Noah's story to mind, and, and what stands out to you the most is Noah's stick to itiveness. That's just a fancy word for Moses kept his hand on the plow. He was determined to finish the responsibility that was laid before him, come hell or high water, pun intended. And so uh, some of you think back on Noah's story and say, yeah, I I'm just grateful at his ability to not be distracted and his ability to not be deterred, but to keep on doing what he was doing. Someone else said, yeah, that sounds good. But what stands out to me about Moses' story was his, or Noah's story was his thick skin. That, that as he was fulfilling the responsibility that God placed on his heart, can you imagine the people that, that made jokes about him, that mocked him, that made fun of him, uh, as they watched him construct this weird-looking huge ark uh, when there was no water near it on dry land? Can you imagine how foolish that made Noah look in the eyes of other people? But he kept on going rather uh, than stop because he had some thick skin. Somebody else might say, yeah, that doesn't really do it for me. What does it for me was the harmonious cohabitation of the animals on the ark. Can you imagine lions and tigers and bears and, and snakes and monkeys and hyenas and any other animal that you can think of that was alive and well on that ark that created in harmony. Nobody tried to kill the other one. Uh, no one was trying to render the other animals extinct, but for that long period of time that they existed together, they were on that ark unharmed. Then somebody else might say, well, what stands out to me the most was Noah's ministry to his family. Sure, he might have tried to save others. Sure, he might have even preached to others. But it's good to see at the end of the day that he wasn't more concerned about saving others at the expense of his family. But on that arc, he was able to look around and see that his family was safe as well. Listen, if, if those are the things that stand out to you about Noah's story, I'll be the first to lift my hands and shout with you. But, but let me just add something here. That that's not really what makes me shout the loudest when I look at Noah's story. But what excites me the most about Noah's story, it might not be you, uh, but what excites me the most about Noah's story was Noah's ability to believe in rain when the only basis he had was something God told him. Oh, I hope, hope y'all are catching that the way the Lord gave it to me. Listen, you, you know that this is the uncharted leadership conference. Yeah, uh, uncharted means something that's unknown. And the fact that we're being ushered into some seasons and walks in our life, uh, that there are no footprints to show us where to go, that no one trailblazed that path before. And it might not be something that gets you out of your seat, but what makes me shout about Noah's story was Noah's ability to believe in rain without argument without deliberation, without debate, without him questioning how impossible 
impossible that sounds. Without him saying to God, I've never seen that before. Without him saying to God, well, no one else is going to believe anything as crazy and as foolish and as outlandish as that. No, what speaks the most to my heart right now, especially in this season in which I'm being called to lead, was Noah's ability to actually believe in rain when the only thing he had to base it off of was something that God told him. And so here's the reality. Don't miss this. Here's the reality. Uh, and, and sometimes we like to over-spiritualize and overvalue these Bible characters. But one thing I need us to understand about Noah was that Noah was not trying to be an innovative leader. Uh, Noah might not have even considered himself a leader at all. The, the reality is he wasn't trying to be an innovative leader. Noah was just crazy enough, y'all, to believe something God told him. Yeah, as crazy as me saying to my two-year-old daughter, ice cream's about to fall from the sky and watch as she gathers her bucket, believing what her father told her. Noah was just crazy enough, y'all, to believe something God told him. Watch this, even though he had never seen it before. And so here it is. Uh, I, and I, ho I hope that you can get this the way that, that, that God gave it to me. So I'm going to give it unapologetically because I know the Lord gave it to me. Uh, I need you to hear me loud and clear on this. We don't need more innovative leaders. I just want you to sit with that just for a moment. Because I know we're a society that clamors for different. We, wanna, we clamor for new. We clamor for innovation. We clamor for out of the box. That's our favorite phrase, right? Uh, I need you to understand that we don't need more innovative leaders. <clears throat> well, we don't need more out of the box leaders. No, no, no. Here's what we need. We need more leaders sold out to believing whatever God tells them, regardless of how crazy it sounds, regardless of whether or not they get the applause from the people that are watching, uh, regardless of whether they can prove whatever it is God's telling them. Well, what I'm suggesting is we don't need more leaders trying to be out of the box. We need more leaders that are sold out to believing whatever God tells them, and watch this, and then leading accordingly. Oh, okay, okay. So, so, so here it is. Uh, and I put myself right in this category, so the, so the Holy Spirit humbling me on this. There are so many of us who are more enamored with being innovative than being obedient. I need, I need you to catch that, y'all. And I need you to hear my heart on this. There, there are so many of us, leaders, who are more enamored with being innovative, with being out of the box, than we are with being obedient. And watch this. Here is what happens when we're more hell-bent on innovation. We start providing things that nobody needs. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so, so we had a whole world right now that's filled with stuff that people started, that people created, that they thought was innovative, that they thought were out of the box, and they created all this new stuff just for the sake of being able to say, no one's done this before. Does not matter that nobody's using their product. Does not matter that it flopped. Does not matter that nobody's clamoring for it. Uh, they can say at the end of the day, when I go to my grave, I created something. I led something. I started something that nobody else started. And so here is what happens when we're hell-bent on innovation and on being out of the box and that becomes the main impetus and driving force of my leadership wherever I'm leading I start providing stuff that nobody needs and so here's what Noah is teaching me y'all and I'm almost done here's what Noah's teaching me that when we're obedient help me Holy Ghost that when we're obedient we can provide what people need even before they know they need it. Uh, listen, y'all, And the reason why I'm scared to present this message is because I know that the Lord's going to hold me accountable to what I'm saying to you, and he's going to call me out into some uncharted territories that I'm scared to go in. And I'm telling you right now, with everything in my heart, I ain't got to lie to nobody. It, it is 
fearful for me to venture into the unknown. As a leader, with all the accomplishments I may have, I get scared whenever it comes time to venture off into some territory that I've never been in. Yeah, I lack courage when it comes to that. I could be real about that. I lack courage when it comes to that because I would much rather be safe and walk in the footsteps of somebody else before me. I would rather play it safe and know that I'm going to be successful before I venture off into it because I've seen that somebody else already did it before me. Where here is what Noah is encouraging me and convicting me with, that when we're obedient, not innovative, when we're obedient, not out of the box, when we are obedient, not different, when we're obedient, we can provide what people need even before they know that they need it. Listen, if I could sum this thing up in one statement, here it is right here. Leaders, I hope you're listening, leaders. If you want to take your leadership to the next level, I know I do, and I pray that you do as well. Here's the word tonight. Stop chasing innovation and start chasing obedience. Yeah, that's it. That's it right there. I ain't got nothing too deep for you. Stop chasing innovation and start chasing obedience. You want to know why? Because obedience tells you that the world needs an ark before they even know what rain is. Oh. Did you catch that? Obedience, not innovation. Obedience, not out of the box. Obedience tells you that the world needs an ark even before they know what rain is. And here's what I need you to understand about Brother Noah. Noah was no more gifted as a leader than you are. Noah had no special powers. He had no special abilities. In fact, I would venture enough to say that for most of you, if not all of you watching, you're more qualified for leadership than Noah was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you have more accolades as a leader than Noah did. No, Noah is, wasn't any more gifted than you are, and so that's why God chose him to lead his people through a flood. No, no, no. Uh, he had no special abilities or powers. In fact, you'd be hard-pressed to find anything significant about Noah either before or after his flood experience. Here was Noah's main claim to fame. You ready for it? Yeah. Here, here was his claim to fame. We find it right in verse five. Noah did all the Lord commanded of him. How, that, listen, that, that's the shout moment right there. Here's what made Noah famous. Here's what separated Noah from the crowd. Here's what made sure that Noah stayed ahead of the curve and in the game, made sure he was relevant and that he was needed, that made sure that he was different, that unlike other leaders, Noah did all that God told him to do. Let, let me give you the Cliff Notes version. Noah was obedient. Ah! And his obedience caused him to perform one of the greatest leadership ventures in all of history. So here it is. Here it is. I, I'm done, y'all. Uh, uncharted leadership requires three things. I, you know, I'm going to give you something before I finish. Uh, take notes, write these things down, if, if you will. Uh, uncharted leadership requires three things. You ready? The first thing that uncharted leadership requires is opportunity. I know I can't hear you, but just say it with me. Opportunity. The first thing that uncharted leadership, if I'm learning it from Noah, the first thing it requires is opportunity. Yeah. The greatest thing that can happen to your leadership is a word from the Lord. Yeah, yeah. no one even knew who Noah was until God's word came to him. And, and, and listen, listen, here's the harsh reality right here. Don't pray for a word from the Lord if you prefer to be comfortable. Yeah, uncharted, we're not talking about any kind of leadership. I guess anybody can be a leader, but uncharted leadership in times of crisis like what we're in right now, in times of uncertainty, much like what we're in right now, one of the first things that requires is opportunity. And, and the opportunity comes by way of a word from the Lord. But you best believe that when a word from the Lord comes, it ain't coming to keep you comfortable. It ain't, it, it ain't coming to, to let you operate in your sweet spot and in your safe spot. It's coming to shake some things up. It's coming to test your faith. It's coming to test your ability and my ability to hang on that word, not because I can prove it, not because I've seen it before, not because everybody supports it, but simply because God's the one that gave it to me. Opportunity is the first thing unchartered leadership requires. Not only that, here's the second thing. 
Uncharted leadership requires opposition. Oh, that's a tough word right there because we don't like opposition. But I'm suggesting from Noah that if we're going to be leaders in uncharted times, successfully, God's way, then not only does it require opportunity, but it requires opposition. Let, let me put it this way. I would question your leadership if there were nobody else questioning your leadership. Yeah. Uh, in, in other words, there's something wrong when everybody likes the way you're going. When everybody likes the way you're leading. I mean, not one person questioned your leadership. Yeah. Noah, Noah seems to suggest that, that uh, opposition is often the evidence that we're headed in the right direction. You see, we've been looking at it the wrong way all this time. We've been seeing our opponents and saying, man, this must mean I'm not cut out for this. This must mean uh, uh, God got the wrong one. This must mean I don't have the gift. And no, 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 no. Let, let, let's look at it a different way. Could it be that your opposition has come as a testament that you're doing something right? And so imagine what would have happened if Noah allowed his opposers to squander his opportunity. And this is why a word from the Lord, opportunity, this is why a word from the Lord is important. I, I know you, you can get with me on this. See, as hard as leadership is, I can keep plunging forward when I know I'm moving in a direction God told me to move in. Yeah, see, when the, the issue is, is that many of us, including myself sometimes, we're operating not based on a word that the Lord gave us, but an idea that we thought of ourselves. And it becomes virtually impossible for me to ignore the naysayers when all I have to hang on is the fact that I had a good idea, right? Uh, it, it becomes difficult for me to ignore those who are cast in doubt when all I have to go on is the fact that when I was sleeping at night, I just thought of something special. No, but, but it's altogether different when I can say with certainty that the Lord placed this thing on my heart, that the Lord placed this thing on my mind, that this thing does, is not from human origin, but it was divine in origin, that God is the one that spoke this word on my heart and spoke this word into my mind. God's the one that opened up this leadership opportunity. God's the one that told me what to do and where to go and how to go. And when I know that it was God without a shadow of a doubt that place this vision, that place this mindset in me, it does not matter if my mama speaks against me. I'm moving forward because at the end of the day, I may not have your support. I may not have their support, whoever they are, but I know at the end of the day, this came from God. So that's why I'm saying from my heart, y'all, don't grow in love with innovation. Here it is. Uncharted leadership requires opportunity. Secondly, it requires opposition. Thirdly, it requires obedience. Don't fall in love with innovation. Regardless of what you do as a leader, listen to me, there will always be someone who can outdo it. As great of an idea as you can think on your own, there'll always be someone who can ideate better. Believe me, fall in love with obedience. Don't fall in love with innovation. Don't fall in, in love with out of the box. Don't fall in love with being different. Fall in love with obedience. Because not only will God make sure that there's always room for your leadership, but he will also make sure that people will be impacted by your leadership. If I'm taking anything from Noah, I'm excited about his ability to believe in something that he had never seen when all he had to base it on was something God told him. Leaders, as we continue to move into uncharted territory, it requires opportunity. Don't try to manufacture your own opportunity. Let God do that. It requires a word from the Lord. It requires opposition. Don't think you're going to get there without troubled waters. It requires opposition and it requires obedience. It's my prayer that through God's power and our obedience that we will change the world.
Lord, I thank you so much for calling us at such a time as this. I pray that my feeble efforts to transfer the message that you gave to me did not fall on deaf ears or hardened hearts. Use us, Lord, beyond our capabilities, and we'll give you the praise and the glory. We thank you for this uncharted leadership conference and the vision you placed on Pierre. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.